So hello everyone, my name is Rebecca Lewis and I am the Visitor Services Specialist for the Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge. We are, um, or um, I'm helping out the friends of the Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge and they are a 501c3 nonprofit established in 1997 to support Ohio's only National Wildlife Refuge complex with youth development, public use projects, and most recently land acquisition and restoration. They are, we are located along the southern shore of Lake Erie near Oak Harbor and some of the most critical wetland habitats in the world. If you are interested in learning more about them and what they do, I'll add a link in the chat in just a moment. This link will point you in the right direction to become a member, uh, makes it, make a tax deductible donation to support their work or even to shop their online nature store. Today, I am joined by Kim Smith, we are from, uh, are you representing Toledo Naturalists or just yourself? No, this is just me. <laughs> just me. She's amazing. Um, <laughs> so she has so graciously joined us today to share her program, Oodles of Odes. And I know I'm super excited about uh, learning more about dragonfly identification. So before we begin, we'll ask you to stay muted to minimize background noise for our presenter and please type any questions in the chat box and we will have um, questions, we'll answer them all at the end. I will now turn it over to Kim to get started. Okay, great. And if, we, if my computer works, I'm gonna share my screen. It's not even letting me share my screen. <laughs> it will. <laughs> oh yeah, you have to let me do it, right? Um, you should still have it. No, it's not. Well. There it goes, I got it back. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> in case anyone didn't know, this is the first time I've ever done a public program. And so there might be some glitches here and a little bit of nerves at the beginning. Uh, I'm gonna try and hide all of our faces so I can see my screen. Okay, can you see just the slides now, Rebecca? Yes. Okay, here we go, great, thanks. So thank you so much, Rebecca, and thanks to the Friends of Ottawa for inviting me to be part of this wonderful series of webinars that you guys have had this spring and summer. I am beyond excited to be able to talk to everybody about my favorite insects, the dragonflies. And if you didn't know, dragonflies have been around for more than 250 million years. And in all that time, they've barely changed based on fossils that have been found. And so my personal theory about that is because they're already perfectly evolved and they don't need to evolve anymore. <laughs> And so what I hope by the end of this program is you're, you're going to agree with me that they're the coolest bugs on the planet. So let's go. Okay, and before we dive into everything, I need to clarify a little bit of terminology for you. Dragonflies and damselflies belong to the scientific order Odonata, and so I'm going to use the word odes a lot as a shorthand. And I'm not an entomologist, and I'm going to call them bugs too, so they're not true bugs. So don't cringe when you hear me say that, it's just another form of shorthand. And you may also hear me just call them dragonflies when I'm talking about the dragonflies and the damselflies, sort of as an umbrella term. And when I'm only talking about damselflies, I will point that out so you won't be confused. And just to give you some perspective on the numbers, we have about 6,300 species of uh, Odonata in the world. And Ohio has about 150 species now. There have been other species here that have either moved out or gone extinct or for some reason disappeared. So we have 150 species now. And in Toledo, in Lucas County, my home county, we have 100 species now. And there's about a 70-30 split between the dragons and damsels. There are more dragonflies than damsels, so 70% roughly. And yes, this license plate is really my nerdy license plate. <laughs> Don't ask. And what I'm gonna do today is not gonna go through and show you a bunch of slides of different species and give you field marks for identifying them, but rather I wanna just convey why I find them all really fascinating and fun to watch and hope that you'll agree. And one of the first things that I find interesting are their names. So look at the names on the left side of this, the fierce predators. So be honest, even if you didn't know a single thing about these insects, wouldn't you wanna know more about something that could have a fantastic name like a shadow dragon or a snake tail? I know I sure would. Uh, and then look at the names on the right. They, they sound completely harmless, like petal tail or skimmer or glider, but those are also the names of fierce predators. So even before you see any of the insects, there's some intrigue about them, I think, just based on their names. 
And the picture on this slide is a uh, Prince Basket tail. And the reason I'm showing him here is because I'm just proud that I got a picture in focus of him flying because this species does like uh, back and forth patrols on the edge of a pond. So you have to kind of uh, gauge where he's flying and manually focus and try and get a fast shot off. So I just wanted to brag about that little picture. <laughs> Okay, so I'm sure a lot of you are wondering how to tell the difference between a, a dragon and a damsel. So we're going to sort that out first. Um, first, I wanted to remind you about the parts of an insect's body, if you've maybe forgotten that. Um, they have a head, which we all know, that's obvious. Then they have the thorax, which if you can see over here, the thorax is the part behind the head where the wings and the legs are attached. And then they have an abdomen, which you may think of as a tail, but technically it's an abdomen right here. And this is where the reproductive organs are. So I'm gonna to refer to those parts. So I wanted to just make sure that everybody knew what we we're talking about. So on this slide, I have the typical perching postures of dragonflies on the left and damselflies on the right. And I wanna just talk about the difference between them. So if you look at the widow skimmer on the left picture, he's perched with his wings spread flat out to the sides and that's your sort of classic dragonfly pose. And if you contrast that on the other side with the damselfly, this familiar bluet, you can see that his wings are folded together along the abdomen. And that's a classic pose. It's not, you know, it's not written in stone. For example, here's a spread wing damselfly. They have a slightly different wing posture where their wings are spread out like at 45 degree angles. But for the most part, you're gonna see damselflies with their wings folded together. And then another difference is the size of the abdomen. If you notice on that widow skimmer, compared to the damselfly on the other side, the, the abdomen is much thicker and robust. So that's one more difference. Um, the damselflies actually, their abdomens sort of remind me of a little sewing needle and they're actually about the size of a sewing needle. So when you're looking for them floating around in the grass, it's almost like the old saying of trying to find a needle in a haystack, but it's a damselfly in the grass. <laughs> okay, another difference are the eyes. So look at the little inset pictures for, here's the dragonfly. This is a blue faced meadowhawk. And notice how his eyes are a huge part of his face. They're almost half of the face and contrast that with the damselfly over here where these little tiny round eyes like little beads are separated on either side of the head. It's almost like the um, silhouette of a hammerhead shark. That's how I think of them. So that's another difference between dragons and damsels. And then the size overall, um, both dragons and damsels can be really small under an inch long, but the largest damselflies that we have, at least in this part of the country, are only about two and a half inches long. Whereas we have some dragonflies that are up to three and a half inches long. So those are your basic differences and it'll help you try to sort them out when you start going out to find them. And now that you know what they are, you probably wanna know where to find them, right? So the key is to know that they need fresh water for their life cycle. So you can find them doing basically reproductive behaviors at the water. So any still water or flowing water. So you can look at lakes, rivers, ponds, um, even drainage ditches of which, you know, we have so many around farm fields in this part of Ohio you can find dragon and damselflies down in those drainage ditches. And there are other species that specialize in bogs and fens. So any type of fresh water is a, a potential place to find uh, odes. And if you get a chance to go in a kayak or canoe, that's another really great way. That's sort of my little pro tip is to like take a kayak and float it out into a floating mat of vegetation, like maybe, um, water lilies. I always want to say day lilies for some reason, but float it into water lilies and that will stabilize your boat. So then when you're trying to take pictures of an insect that's one or two inches long, you definitely don't need any kind of camera shake. So it, that will help stabilize the boat. So that's what I do a lot. And then, so when they're not at the water, they're out feeding in prairies or wooded areas. So they're only at the water for reproduction, reproduction mostly. And then they go in the woods or prairies or anywhere basically. I have seen them in parking lots, like at Target or Kmart or anything like that. You can find them just about anywhere. And the other thing to know is that they're ectothermic and they need the sun to warm them so they can fly. So you're gonna see a lot more oat activity on a sunny and warm day than you will on a cool or cloudy day. And even if you're out watching them and there are like clouds in the sky and they keep moving around, you can see almost instantly when a cloud covers the sun that they'll stop they'll drop to the ground and they'll, you know, I mean, not drop to the ground, but they'll stop being active. And then when the, the cloud moves away from the sun again, they'll be active again. And since you know that they need to be warm too, that can get, be a good thing for photography. If you go out in the morning before they're warm enough, you can find them kind of hanging on vegetation and you might get uh, 
really good photo ops then too. And then, oh, I should explain this photo too. This is sort of what I call a bonus behavior. They can get overheated too. And this is a flag-tailed spiny leg and he is in the obelisk position. And the reason what he's doing is pointing his abdomen toward the sun. And the purpose of that is to minimize the surface area of his body that's exposed to the direct rays of the sun. So this is a cooling technique that they use. Um, not all dragonflies do this. Some of them will fly like um, up into the leaves, like up in the trees and just hang in there where it's cooler. But some of them do this obelisk position and it's a really great photo opportunity. And the other thing you wanna know when you're going out to find them is you need binoculars. Um, you, they're one or two inches long. You, unless you have bionic eyes, you're not gonna see them very well without binoculars. I just use my uh, birding binoculars, the eight by 42s, and that works fine for me. And if you wanna take pictures home and try to identify them later, you want a camera with a really good zoom lens on it. Also, I don't wanna to talk too much about camera gear you know, which lenses and cameras here, but you definitely need a zoom lens. That's basically all I want to say about cameras. So let's talk a little bit about their life cycle. And a lot of you might not know that they live most of their lives underwater before they're, they become the winged insects that we see and that we tend to think of as dragonflies. But I kind of like to compare them to cicadas because people are more familiar with that life cycle. And you know already that cicadas live underground for many years and then they emerge and come out of their shells and we find those shells hanging on trees, right? Well, that's what we're looking at here in this picture. And this is a dragonfly shell or exuvia or exoskeleton, whatever you wanna call it, but it's the same thing. So they live underwater for a period of time and that varies by the species. It can be um, just a period of weeks or it can be years for some species. But at some point they come out and they come out of that shell and become these winged adults. So I think I forgot to mention the eggs being laid in fresh water. I think I still have a little bit of my nerves going on here, sorry. But that's the, the metamorphosis cycle is on the slide here. So the egg is laid in fresh water and then the larva hatches and lives under the water and then the adult eventually comes out of the water. And a couple of really interesting things I wanted to point out about the part of their life that's underwater. So when they basically look like this little insect they're predators underwater and they feed by using this lower jaw that I don't have a picture of it, but I have a video link, which I'm gonna show you um, where to get that at the end of the program um, on YouTube. But this, they have a lower jaw that shoots forward in like a hundredth of a second and grabs prey. It's really fascinating to see it. So they're really cool predators, even when they're underwater insects. And the best part of all is that they have gills in their butt, okay? so. You, this is something you probably want to share to every, tell everyone that you know, just if you're going to a dinner party or something, dragonflies have butt propulsion. And they, the, they take water in through the gills and then when the water comes out, it, it can be a sort of a locomotion for them. It can help them to chase prey or it can help them to evade predators. So uh, there's a dragonfly expert who has written field guides. His name is Dennis Paulson. And he has called that the miraculous rectum. <laughs> I swear he has. And he even wrote a poem about it called the Miraculous Rectum. I'm not really sure if you can find the poem online. It was shared in one of the Dragonfly journals a few years ago, but I just can't stop thinking about that. It's so funny. <laughs> and I kind of wish that it was easier for us to be able to see them in their underwater stage because that's just as exciting as when they're flying insects that we get to watch easily. And also, believe it or not, you can identify the species of a dragonfly just by looking at these exuvia. So you can go around a pond or any body of water and find these just hanging on vegetation. You can take them home and there are online keys to help you identify which species it is. So that's another fun little hobby you can have. <laughs> okay, so now you've got adult dragonflies that are flying insects. And the main purpose of their life right now is reproduction, of course. And dragonfly mating is another one of the really fun things to watch and to photograph. And uh, it's weird, I mean, it's to talk about insect sex, but they're one of the few insects that have this really interesting and visible like reproduction behavior. So I'm gonna go through the different steps of that. Step one in their mating process is called being in tandem. So the, this slide shows you dragonflies and damselflies in tandem. But before this happens, I wanna explain uh, the male, I'll just show this damselfly here. This is a double striped bluet. Um, he's holding a female here, but before he's done that, he has to transfer sperm from one reproductive organ to another. He's got two separate places. So his main reproductive organ is here at the end of his abdomen. 
So what he has to do is curl it around and there's another organ up here where he transfers the sperm before he mates with her. So this is where she's gonna get the sperm from right here. So both of them, the damselflies and the dragonflies do that. So these are Halloween pennant dragonflies and you can see he's holding the female as well. They're flying around. And there's a difference in how the um, damselflies and the dragonflies hold the females. With the damselfly, it's more like holding her behind her head or on her, what you might think of as the neck. But with the dragonflies, he's basically wrapping, he's got claspers on the end of his abdomen and they go on top of her eyes. And so he's holding the top of her head and it's actually possible for him to puncture her eyes, which if you ask me is really not cool. <laughs> it's bad enough she has to be dragged around behind him, but to then have eye punctures is just adding insult to injury. Um, but anyway, so they might fly around like this for a while uh, before she gets in the mood because the male has done anything, everything he can do at that point and he has to wait for her to take the next step. So this is called being in the wheel. And you might notice right away that looks like a heart, right? It doesn't mean they're in love. It's not romantic. It's just convenient that it happens to look like a shape that we humans find, you know, we have relevance to that shape. But it's a really cool thing to take pictures of too. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here we have damselflies. These are called familiar bluets. This is the male. And now his female, he's still holding her behind the head. And she's curled her abdomen, abdomen around here. And you see where she's connected to that place where he transferred the sperm earlier. And the same thing here, these are calico pennant dragonflies. The male is the red one and the female is yellow. You can see her little legs holding onto his abdomen here. And then she's curled hers up and she's connecting to the same place basically. And there's a little secret in there that male is not just gonna give her sperm. He's first gonna scoop out any sperm from another male that she might've mated with before. And only then is he gonna give her his. So he wants to make sure that his DNA is what's passed on and not anyone else's. Pretty smart, I think. Okay, then the final step is to lay the eggs. So once they fertilize the eggs, they have to do lay egg laying or ovipositing. And this, the way they do this varies a lot by species. So it can take place while they're still in tandem or after they separate. So the pictures here show the Halloween pennants here. So they fertilized the eggs already and they're still connected. He's still controlling the flight basically. And they're flying over a pond and they're hitting the, the water surface with the tip of her abdomen. So every time they hit the water, some more eggs are dropped. So they're gonna like tap, 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 keep flying around this lake. And every time they hit the water, they're dropping more eggs from her. So that's one way that it happens. Another is over here with this dot-tailed white face. This is another dragonfly. And she's been released by the male and she's ovipositing in the water by herself. But what you don't see here is that the male is still flying above her. He's hovering and he's chasing off any other male that happens to, to be trying to grab her and mate with her again and do the same dirty trick that he just did, right? By scooping out the, the sperm. So it's really dramatic and there's, it's a lot of fun to watch them and to watch the males trying to protect the females uh, while they're laying their eggs. Excuse me. And here are a couple more examples of how various species lay their eggs. So on the left here are great spread wings. These are damselflies and they're still connected. And the female right here, she's got an ovipositor that can cut slits in this wood. So they're laying eggs inside this woody branch of maybe a small willow or some kind of tree that's right beside a body of water. And what's gonna happen when those eggs hatch is they're gonna be able to fall down into the water. So if they can't get to water, then they're doomed. So they have to pick the appropriate sort of vegetation where they know that the nymphs can get to the water. This pair here, they're gonna stay in tandem like this and they're gonna move either up or down this stem and keep cutting slits and laying eggs. And then when they're finished, you can actually walk up to that stem and, and see little slits where they have laid eggs. It's really cool. And then here are a bunch of bluets and what I call this is an egg laying party. Um, there might be other words for it, but I'm trying to keep this PG-13. But if you can kind of see under the water, there's some vegetation there, little stems and stuff. So they're all here because of that vegetation. So each of these females, you can see she's got an abdomen curled around and she's laying eggs inside the stems of that vegetation. Sometimes you can see huge numbers of them if there's a, a big enough mat of vegetation. Whoops, my thing is not moving. Okay, one more. Um, this is one of our largest darners. This is called a comet darner. This is a female, obviously. She's laying eggs by herself. Um, but the male of this species, this abdomen part is much brighter red. And so I, I'm sure they got that name because when they fly past you over a pond, they look like a comet streaking past. 
And they're another one that's really hard to get a photograph of when they're flying. So when you get to see them on the water like this, it's a, like a bonus photo opportunity. Okay, let's talk just a little bit more about their lives. And then we're gonna look at some pictures of different species and talk about some other stuff. But dragonflies and damselflies are predators, they're fierce predators really, in both stages of their life. So when they're aquatic larvae, they prey on mosquito larvae in the water and any other insects that, or, that happen to be in the water. So they're really good hunters there. And then when they're winged adults, they prey on other flying insects and on each other. They eat other dragon and damselflies. No problem with that. <laughs> Um, and they're really efficient predators too. I wanted to mention too how we think of cheetahs as really fast and efficient hunters, but a cheetah only catches its prey about 40 or 50% of the time. And a dragonfly is successful in hunting about 95% of the time. And part of the reasons for that are their eyes and their flight capabilities. So with those, these big eyes, they have these compound eyes and each one of those eyes can have up to, I think it's 30,000 simple eyes in it. And so they have almost a 360 degree field of vision with maybe a tiny blind spot directly behind them. I'm not sure. But in addition to that eyesight, they have those wings that can fly. They can, each wing can rotate on a different, on its own axis so they can, you know, fly independently. Each wing goes a different way. So they can fly forward, backward, upside down. They can hover, they can fly up to about 30 miles an hour. So combining that with that vision, you can kind of get an idea of why it's hard for anything to evade them. <clears throat> And the story about this photo, I was over at Oak Openings Metro Park one day by Mallard Lake and there was a big grassy field behind it. And I was watching a whole bunch of these club tailed dragonflies. And suddenly I heard this loud bzz right beside my head. And these two dropped to the ground right in front of me. And a lot of times, I mean, it's fun to watch a predatory insect eat other insects, but most of the time they're eating tiny little things that I can barely see. And and they're breaking into little pieces that are unidentifiable. So you don't feel sorry for, really for the insect that they eat. But in this case, the fish fly was like thrashing its body back and forth. And, and I got so many pictures in this series. And I particularly like this one because of the proximity of their faces. I thought it's kind of dramatic how the fish fly is looking at the dragonfly while he's eating them. <laughs> so I, I hope that's not grossing anybody out, but I just think it's really fascinating that we're able to watch their lives so easily like this. And so not only are they predators, but they're prey in both stages of their life. So when they're living under the water, they get eaten by other insects and they get eaten by fish. But once they're adults, they're eaten by so many things, especially birds. And I have these two pictures here. The one on the left, I borrowed from uh, Terry Norris. She's a photographer who's in our Facebook group, Odonata, Ohio. And she took this picture of a yellow-throated vireo eating a swamp darner. And you can see that it's got the head of the darner in its mouth. And apparently a lot of dragonflies just eat the, or a lot of birds just eat the heads and drop the bodies. I'm not sure. We were talking about whether that's where the most of the protein is. I don't know. But that's a really fantastic picture. And I think she said she took that at McGee Marsh. And then the other picture was mine. I was watching a dragonfly and taking pictures of it. And suddenly this red-winged blackbird dropped out of the sky and grabbed it. And you can see with where the arrow is, there's only half of a dragonfly body there. So this wasn't the photo op that I expected to get, but it's, it's better maybe than what I was taking. So um, also, also in addition to birds, so they get eaten by frogs. Once I was at a pond and I saw a frog jump up and pull a dragonfly off of a cattail and drag it under the water. And then the dragonfly was like furiously trying to fly back out and he managed to crawl back up that stem but just for like two seconds and the frog came back and pulled him down for the, the final time. <laughs> um, they get eaten by spiders who build webs right on the edge of uh, like a pond or something and they just wait for the dragonfly to fly into it. And again, like I said, other dragonflies eat them. So here's a picture of that. This is an Eastern pond hawk dragonfly eating an Eastern amber wing. And there's a size difference in these two, obviously, but I have seen damselflies eating other damselflies that are roughly the same size, so that just because one is bigger or smaller doesn't seem to make that much difference. And also these uh, pond hawks, this is the pond hawk, they tend to be the ones that I see eating other dragonflies the most often, and I'm not really sure why that is, or you know, maybe it's just that I see more of them than anything else. They're very common at most ponds around here. Okay, now we're gonna look at some pictures of different species and talk about a few different things. 
Uh, these are Eastern amber wings. There's some of the, our smaller dragonflies. This is what was being eaten in that slide that I just showed you. Uh, we've got a female on the left here and a male on the right. And I wanted to use this to illustrate that a lot of dragonflies are sexually dimorphic. And that means that the male and female look different. They have maybe different colors or patterns on the wings or the bodies. So you can clearly see the wings are different on that female. She's got just clear wings with brown splot splotches on them, splotches on them. And the male's wings are more like uniformly colored. And he's doing his ballerina pose, I think, no. That's the obelisk pose, do you remember, from earlier, pointing his abdomen up to the sun as a cooling technique. And then one more illustration of that sexual dimorphism is the Eastern pond hawk. Um, the, the, this is a male and a female on the same branch here. You can clearly see the difference. The male's blue, the, green, the female is green with black on her abdomen. But what do you suppose that is? That's an immature male. So he started out looking like a female, just like this, the same colors and patterns. And over a period of about two weeks, he's turning blue. So he's gonna look like that mature male. And I like finding them sort of halfway through the process. You can see that he's turned blue halfway up his body and he's still got this maybe another week to go. I don't know for sure how the pr process happens, but it looks like he's halfway done. And they're really pretty too when they're half blue and green, I think. And there's a really quick ID tip for this species, even if you didn't know anything else about how to identify them. If you see the white cersei here at the end of the abdomen, the little claspers here, that's the only species we have that has those white claspers. So that can tell you pond hawk right away. <clears throat> And now if you're new at finding dragonflies and you want to take pictures of them, the skimmer family are the ones that you're probably going to notice first and find the easiest to take pictures of. We've got uh, these calico pennants here. We have 12 spotted pennants, banded pennants, Halloween pennants, and we have widow skimmers and painted skimmers. So they're all sort of similar with patterns on their wings and they'll perch up just like these are. So you can take pictures of them pretty easily. Um, notice again, the male on the left is red and the female's yellow. And on the next slide, I'm gonna show you, this is an immature male. So he started out yellow like the female and he's turning red, but this one seemed to be kind of a pretty golden orange color. So I, I just found him recently at Wiregrass Lake when I was doing my uh, regular dragonfly monitoring surveys. So uh, that was fun. And you can see why I call these a love dragon because of the heart pattern down the back of the abdomen. I, don't, I think I have more pictures of this species than anything else, mostly because of the heart pattern. <laughs> okay, here is a common white tail, which not surprisingly is very common. And this one, for some reason, likes to sit on man-made structures like a sidewalk or a boardwalk or a fence. And they also land on people. As you can see, this one's on my shirt. This was taken at one of our dragonfly conventions. Believe it or not, we have dragonfly conventions. They're called Otakon. It's kind of like Comic Con, but for bug dorks. <laughs> so notice that the male here is uh, got, he has different patterns on his wings and his body, his abdomen is also different than the female. So when you're learning them, you have to be aware of the difference in the male and the female so you don't get confused. And these are some pictures of them on flowers. It's always fun when you find them perched on a flower, but uh, don't be confused and think that they're pollinators because they're not there because of the pollen or the nectar. They're just using it because it's a convenient perch for feeding or resting or something. So um, they're not going to, I think they're maybe, I guess they might eat a, if there was an insect sitting, say right here, a little beetle or something, you might eat it. But generally dragonflies catch their food on the wing. So something that's flying and they'll either scoop it up in their legs and then put it in their mouth or they can grab it right in their mouth. But Generally, they're not gonna sit on flowers for feeding purposes like that. Oh, also there's a tip too I wanted to tell you. If you happen to find one perched up, uh, whether it's a flower or a stick or whatever, and you're trying to focus on it to take a picture and then it flies away, um, don't give up and think it's gone. Just wait because a lot of times they're gonna come right back to the exact same perch over and over and over. So they might just fly out for five seconds and grab an insect and come back, or they might be gone for 30 seconds. But I have watched them for like 15 minutes coming back to the exact same perch before. So be patient, you might still get your photo. Okay, now these are blue dashers. Uh, I think I had a blue dasher on the opening slide. So these are also very common here and they're kind of small. 
This is a male here on the left and a female on the right. Again, notice a different pattern. On, he's more solid blue, like a bluish white, and she's brown with yellowish spots or dashes on her. The eye color is different too. The male has those bright green eyes and the female's got brown on the top and there's sort of a blue or gray underneath. So very, very different. And I'll never forget really the first time that I found <laughs> what I thought was a really exotic and rare dragonfly. I was at Mommy Bay State Park. I was taking dozens of pictures and already starting to build the story in my head to tell my friends about this fantastic dragonfly that I found. And I got home and found out it was a female blue dasher. So for some reason, I had never seen the female, right? The males are the ones with all the drama. So you pay more attention to them, kind of like in the birding world too, right? With warblers, we all focus on the males and their beautiful breeding plumage and the females get overlooked. So I learned a lesson there that now I'm starting to learn the females a lot better. And now, so this, these blue dashers, as I said, they're small, but they're very, very bold in their attitude. And I have a little story to tell you about that. Um, I was out in Williams County in the far northwest corner of Ohio. I was at Lake La Suan, and I was watching dragonflies at a pond, and I found this spangled skimmer at the top of a perch, and he was just minding his own business, taking advantage of this prime perch and hunting, and, and then suddenly this little blue dasher comes along, and his eyes turn green with envy because he wanted this top of the perch. So he starts dive bombing the spangled skimmer over and over and over, and he did manage to knock him off the perch a few times, but when they settled back down, the spangled skimmer was always at the top. So the blue dasher had to give up and go find another perch somewhere else. But he was pretty brave for trying. And I mentioned earlier one of our largest dragonflies. This is a dragon hunter. He's three and a half inches long. And he's one of the club tail family who tend to have these enlarged abdomen tips. It's a little blurry in this picture, but you can see it's a little bit enlarged here. And if you remember earlier, I showed you that flag-tailed spiny leg who was in the obelisk position pointing his abdomen up and he had a really big flag or club on the end of his abdomen. He's one of these also. And notice here how there's a separation between the eyes. That's a clue that this is in the club tail family. So as I said earlier, most of the dragonfly eyes, they'll meet at the top of the head and they cover half the face, but in the club tails, there's separation between the eyes. And yes, he does eat dragons. Uh, I found him at the Swanton Reservoir and he let me get kind of close. I mean, I had a big zoom lens, but I, I might have been 10 feet from him. I don't know. And I have this picture printed on a two foot long canvas hanging in my kitchen. <laughs> it's weird. And I, I swear I do have big dragonfly pictures all over my house. So that's just another weird thing, I guess. I think they're beautiful. I don't know if other people get creeped out by it, but I don't. And so I wanted to show you a couple more club tails because they're so distinctive. Um, in addition to that clubbed abdomen, notice their big blue and green eyes. This one's got bluish eyes and this one's got greenish eyes. And they have distinctive markings on their thorax and the abdomen. And what, when you get a field guide and you try to start learning to identify club tails, they're some of the hardest ones to identify. Um, but the field guide is going to refer to the stripes on the thorax by a numbered system. They call them like T1, T2, T3. And they might tell you, you know, T1 is thick or thin or absent or something like that. And then on the abdomen, they're also going to describe this. There are 10 segments on the abdomen, and they number them from S1 up here to S10. And so a field guide will tell you maybe something like S4 through 6 have a yellow triangle on the top, and S8 and 9 have some yellow on the sides and nothing on the top, or something like that. So you just need to be able to understand the terminology that in the body parts so that when you read the field guide, you can figure out what they're talking about. And another thing to know is that for some species, the identification from one to the other comes down to something as tiny as a little spike on the end right here. Like maybe on the Circe, there's a downward facing spike on one or not on the other. So you have to try and get as many photos from different angles as you can and as focused as you can, because unless you know for sure what you need to identify each species, you don't really know which photo is going to be important. So um, try to take them from the front, back, sides, whatever you can get. Uh, if you have a cooperative bug who's flying out and then coming back and landing in a different position so you can see them from a different angle, that's always the best situation. Uh, sometimes you can try to just be really stealthy and sneak up on them and move around the side and that sometimes works, but you have to be very stealthy. This, I have all the names on the slides. I hope you're not noticing them and I don't have to read those, but this one's called a pronghorn clubtail and this is a midland clubtail. He's 
uh, in midair coming down to land on a pipe at the uh, canal at Providence Metro Park. And I've been neglecting the damselfly so far, but that's mostly because they're harder for beginners to get excited about because they're so small and hard to find. But if you have the patience to do that, it's really worth it because they're just as beautiful as the dragonflies and they don't fly away as quickly. They're not as strong flyers. And if you happen to see one and you accidentally flush it out of the grass, it might just go a foot away from you and go down again. So they're easier to follow and to try and get the photographs if you have the patience to find them. And note, I mentioned spread wing damselflies once earlier, but I wanted to point that out again. These have the, their wings out at a 45 degree angle, as opposed to how a lot of the other damselflies hold their wings folded together. So that's a, a clue to this type of uh, damselfly. Oops. And these are some more of the damselflies. There are forktails, bluets, and dancers. And again, with the names, right? Aren't those cool names? <laughs> Uh, on the left is an eastern fork tail. He's very, very common, one of the earliest ones to come out each year. And this is a male. You can see he's got green markings on his eyes, the back of his eyes and his, ab his thorax. And then his abdomen is mostly black with some very distinctive blue pattern here at the end. So that's how we tell him apart from the others. These are stream bluets in a mating wheel or the heart, whatever you want to call it. Um, when you start looking at a field guide for damselflies, it's going to talk to you about these eye spots on the back of the head, the size of the spots, and whether or not they're connected with a bar between them. And then it's going to talk again about the pattern on the thorax and the patterns on the abdomen. Notice again, the female's a different color than the male here. And then this is a blue-fronted dancer that I'm showing um, here mostly because of how he's holding his wings. So they are still folded together, but they're not down along the abdomen. They're slightly up above the abdomen, and that's kind of typical of the dancers. So when you're looking at these on the computer or when you go out and you're looking at them through binoculars or um, through a big camera, a zoom lens on the camera, uh, I've always been surprised whenever I get to see one in someone's hand how tiny they really are because you don't really understand that when you're always looking at them magnified. So I wanted to show you this. On the left, that citrine forktail is one of our tiniest little damselflies. It's under an inch long and someone's holding that after they netted it at a dragonfly event. And then the other picture I borrowed from Derek Bridgehouse who he's got our largest and smallest dragonflies in his hand together to show you the difference in size. So the one on the top is that dragon hunter that I mentioned before that's three and a half inches long. And then below is an elfin skimmer. And that one is about three quarters of an inch long, I think. And that's our smallest dragonfly here. But we don't actually have elfin skimmers here in Northwest Ohio, but we do have them at Cedar Bog in Urbana. So I usually go to Cedar Bog once a year just to see the elfin skimmers. It's amazing to see them in a hand like that, I think. Okay, and dragonflies cannot hear you at all. They have no sense of hearing but they can always see you, right? They've got those eyes, that's their superpower. And I mentioned before the 360 degree field of vision. Um, sometimes I, I think if you catch them when they're mating or eating something they've just caught, they're a little preoccupied and maybe they won't fly away so fast. But if they're just sitting there looking at you like this unicorn club tail, you have to just freeze and, and try to move really, really slowly if you wanna get closer and closer to keep getting pictures of them. So. And notice again, this is a club tail. He's got his eyes separated in the middle. And contrast that to the eyes here on the Spatterdock Darner and the River Cruiser, their eyes both meet in the middle. So there you have the clear difference between the different families of dragonflies. This Spatterdock Darner is one of the, the large darners. He's uh, in a family they call, or a type we call mosaic darners. They, their bodies are blue and brown with really pretty patterns on them. And the Wabash River Cruiser here is actually being studied now as a possible hybrid of two other river cruisers. And there's not that much known about whether dragonflies and damselflies can hybridize because, you know, they have those claspers at the end that it's thought that they were species specific, like this one only fits into this one, like a puzzle piece. And so they couldn't hybridize. But if this one is a hybrid, then that theory is out the window. And there may be at least some, some flexibility in who can mate with who. And we have about 16 species of dragonflies in North America that migrate, just like birds, believe it or not. And uh, the common green darner is the one that's most known as a, a migrant, and they come back earliest every year. So 
Um, we usually see the green darner showing up here in early or mid-April. And whereas the other species of dragonflies that live here in the water and have to emerge when it's warm enough, they won't come out until mid-May. So these migratory ones come back earlier each year. And you can see swarms of them in the fall, especially um, mig migratory swarms of dragonflies. I've seen those at, uh, say, McGee Marsh or at Metzger Marsh, also at Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge, and along the river, too, at Middle Ground Metro Park, I've seen them. Um, I don't have too much information about that. There's a website where you can go to read more information about um, dragonfly migration. It's called migratorydragonflypartnership.org. And there's so much not known about dragonflies, by the way. I mean, birds and butterflies and other life forms have been studied so much more than dragonflies have. So there's so much more out there to be discovered, which makes it more exciting to me. Um, this is another of the migratory dragonflies. It's known to have the longest migration of all dragonflies. It's 11,000 miles, and that's even longer than uh, monarch butterfly migration that everyone thinks is so amazing, right? Um, this one has a nickname of globe skimmer for obvious reasons. And I've highlighted the width of its hind wing here. And that's uh, a lot of these migratory species have wider hind wings. And that is thought that maybe, you know, maybe that lets them glide on air currents better or just to be able to fly longer. So there may be some physical difference that allows them to do that. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention too. Um, usually you see them flying like this. You hardly ever see them like this, but in the late summer, you'll find these uh, flying around parking lots, tapping on windshields, and they're actually laying eggs on your car windshield because they're seeing that reflection and they're mistaking it for water and they're laying their eggs on it. So it's a fatal mistake because those eggs can't survive, but it seems to be very, very common. I've had them tapping on my windshield lots of times. So just uh, let's just re review a few of the basics. Um, you want to, if you want to learn how to identify them, you need to know those basic body parts, the head, thorax, and the abdomen, you know, segments one through 10. And remember that males and females can look different and that young males sometimes look like females. So you have to not get confused by that. You, I didn't point it out here, but you can identify a male and a female by the um, reproductive organs at the end of their abdomen. But I thought that's beyond the scope of today. We're just touching on the basics here, but you can learn to identify them just by that alone. And if you get a field guide and you're starting to look through trying to identify a bug that you took a picture of, pay attention to the flight times, if they're like early season or late season flyers and the habitat preferences, because sometimes a field guide can be overwhelming if you've got so many bugs that kind of look alike and you're just flipping through it until you go cross-eyed. So pay attention to some of those details and that can help you narrow it down. And I've already mentioned taking photos um, from as many different angles as possible. And right now I'm using a 100 to 400 millimeter lens. I have seen people use different lenses and get good results. So it all depends on what works for you. There's no magic formula for which lens is going to work. You just have to try it and see. And this is a full body picture of that Wabash River Cruiser that I showed you uh, just ahead of it a minute ago. This is the one that's maybe a hybrid of two other river cruisers. And you notice how he's perching too. He's hanging vertically from below that branch. So that's another way to distinguish different families too by the way they perch. And here are some of the field guides that we use, the main ones that we have right now. The one on the left here is Dragonflies and Damselflies of the East by Dennis Paulson. Um, and you don't have to write all of this down. Like I said, at the end, I'm gonna give you the address of my website where I have a lot of this information for you. So don't worry about writing that down. But uh, Dennis Paulson's book, uh, Dragonflies of the East is about 500 pages. And he has a separate volume for the dragonflies of the West, dragon and damsels of the West. And then the one in the middle is uh, as close as we have right now to a regional guide for Ohio. And that one is dragon and damselflies of Northeast Ohio. And that was published by the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. And unfortunately it's out of print right now. And if you go to Amazon looking for it, I think it's $50 right now. <laughs> So, I mean, if you're willing to pay that, it's a fantastic book and you might find it for less than that. But um, right now that is a regional one that we use even for Northwest Ohio. So they, cover, they have different species in Northeast Ohio than we have here, but there's a lot of overlap too. So it's very useful. And then on the right is Damselflies of the Northeast. And this book uh, for years, I have been telling everyone I know to get this book, get this book because it's, it's only 95 pages. And 
um, it has beautiful drawings by the author, Ed Lamb, of every possible variation of every damselfly there is. Um, but the problem is, again, so that one is on Amazon for about $50. And the author, Ed Lamb, was selling it on his website for $20 uh, for years. And I just found out that he's apparently run out of them. So I think you may, if you want to get that, you might have to try and find a used copy uh, or wait for him. He's, I think he's looking into a reprinting of it, but it's a really great book. And the Ohio DNR also has a little sort of pamphlet field guide to Ohio dragonflies. It's maybe four by six inches. And I think they hand them out free at some events, but you can also get it on their website as a free download as a PDF document. And I have a link to that on my website too. So you can get that pretty easily. And as far as um, I mentioned a regional guide for Ohio, there was a dragonfly survey that we did from 2017 to 2019 where we surveyed every county in Ohio and tried to go every possible place and find every species we could find in the whole state to update um, the, you know, the species list for the state. And now the data from that survey is being used to compile a full Ohio field guide for dragon and damselflies. So it got a little bit delayed by the pandemic and a couple other things, but they say that they now have it all written and they're at the stage where they're trying to get the page layouts done. So I think it might be possible that next year maybe late next year, we might see that uh, Ohio Guide to Dragonflies, which would be fantastic. I can't wait to see it. Okay, so I want to wrap up by asking why we should care about these insects. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first thing is that they're environmental indicators of possible habitat problems. So if they're there and then they're not there, what is it? Is, it, is there some problem with the water quality there? Is it a matter of climate change and they're just moving farther north? Um, so that's one thing, to, one reason to pay attention to them. Another thing is that they do a service for us by eating mosquitoes and biting flies, uh, both when they're underwater insects and as they're adults. So I think that's maybe the most important reason right now because I'm completely covered with mosquito bites. They're horrible right now. Um, and the other thing is, so they are really important food source for a lot of the birds, particularly swallows and flycatchers who fly over the ponds and just grab them one after the other and feed them to their babies a lot of times. And the fourth reason is that we need data about them. As I mentioned earlier, uh, they have not been studied nearly as much as birds or butterflies or other things. So any data that you can um, provide to help contribute to the, the information about them is gonna be useful. Um, if you can take pictures and upload them to iNaturalist, that's a gigantic worldwide database that is really useful for the researchers and for us. So, so I can go to iNaturalist right now and do a county level search for any county in Ohio and it'll tell me every species that has ever been reported there and actually shows pictures that people have taken of them. So it's sort of like an instant field guide for any location you want. So I hope you'll start using iNaturalist if you're not already. <clears throat> And last but not least, they're just because they're beautiful and they're fun to watch and they help you form a better connection to the natural world, at least I think. So watching them live their lives and learning more about how they fit into this big puzzle of life has been endlessly fascinating for me and it made my life richer. So that's one of the main reasons that I personally like to watch them. So again, here's the link to my website that I mentioned before. It's natureismytherapy.com. There's a contact me form where you can send me an email and there's also a page of dragonfly resources. So if you just remember this part, natureismytherapy.com, then you'll see menu choices for both of these. So that's, that's the way to get in touch with me and to get some of the resources that I've talked about today. So um, I wanna thank you all for your attention for this very first public program I've ever done. I'm so glad it's almost over, <laughs> but I'm so happy I was able to share this with you. and. I'll be happy to take questions if anyone has them. Rebecca, have you saved questions from the chat or anything? Yes. Um, oh, this one. I, someone said it looks like the damsel wings all come together at the body. Is that correct or are they just close? You mean at the base? Uh, I believe they do. They are pretty much, well, they've got to be separated on either side of that thorax, but they're very close together, if that's what the question is. Um, also, while you're, 
while you're doing that, I've switched to one more slide here that I cut out of the program to save time, but there's some more information on there that you guys can look at while we're doing questions. Got some nice compliments on your Prince basket tail and your flag tail. <laughs> um, Thank guess, you. Do you need more um, information on equipment for the photos? Um, what, what do you want to know? You can unmute Chris. Sure. I, number one, I think your photos are amazing. And I think uh, I probably met you at the dragonfly thing that was held in Ashtabula County. Oh, that was a few years ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I probably saw you there. I was just wondering, you had mentioned you use a zoom lens. Do you use extension tubes or just a regular old zoom lens and a camera? No, I don't use extension tubes, just the one to 400 lens. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure. And Paul got his first club tail today in Nova Scotia. Who is, what? Sorry, what? Uh, Paul Phillip posted in the comments that he got his first club tail today in Nova Scotia. Oh, okay, all right. I thought it was a different Paul. Congratulations. <laughs> um, oh, this one, uh, when you talk about migrating, where do they migrate to and from, or is it different? Oh, don't ask me that. Species? Yeah, even the experts, I think, don't know that. Um, I just would re refer you to that website, the migratory dragonflypartnership.org. I don't have a lot of information about that. I know they've done some attempts at tracking devices on them and stuff, but it's not like with uh, monarchs, they can tag them and they know that they all migrate to the same place and there are people down there looking for them and they can track where they went. But dragonflies, they don't know exactly where they're all going and there aren't that many people looking for them. So how would they recover the tags? So I think that's part of the problem that they don't know. And I personally haven't looked into it that much, to be honest. So just check that website and hopefully you can find the answer to your question. Are ebony jewel weeds a type of damselfly? Yes, and I didn't show you that pic a picture of those at all. Yeah, they're the ones with the black wings. And you find those pretty often in the woods. If there's water that goes through the woods, you'll find them even in shady parts of the woods, you can find those ebony jewel wings. All right, any other questions? Kim, you'll have to check the chat. There's lots of wonderful comments. Oh, and I'm gonna stop compliments. my share. So oh, that's solid. Good. Thank you, yeah, I'm looking at that now. Thank you everyone for being here really. And uh, you know, hopefully it was entertaining and you learned something. Very nice, yeah. Hi, Cindy, thanks for being here. <laughs> oh, I see a question here. Would they eat asparagus beetle larvae? I just got them off and one came around snooping. Um, well, probably not since they usually catch their food on the wing. They catch flying things. So if those are just crawling around the plant, I doubt that they would be eating them. Okay, did I get all the questions? I'm scrolling through, I don't see them anymore. Yeah, I think I... I, yeah, good good idea to double check. So I have to tell oh. you, I lie. I spent years lying to children about um, dragonflies because you know this giant bug comes at them and they freak out. And I'm like, no, 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 no. They only eat insects. They're fine. And <laughs> right. because I like dragonflies much better than spiders, I was getting one out of a web one day at work. It was a great big green one. And um, while I was pulling the spiderweb off of its wings, it was chewing on my fingertip. Oh yeah. It was unbelievable. It was, it's my favorite dragonfly experience ever. So but did it, it actually, did it draw blood or not? No, it was more oh. of a nibble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that, like I don't net them myself, but people who net them have told me that occasionally one of them can draw blood, but they generally can't hurt you. And they're only gonna bite you if you've caught them in a net anyway. And my mom told me when she was a kid, they used to go fishing all the time and they were afraid of them because they thought they could sting them. <laughs> That's another thing that people don't understand about them. Oh, I'm seeing in this chat here that Cindy Crosby has mentioned my blog, which I thank you for that. But I wanna also tell you about her blog. She's got a wonderful blog called Tuesdays in the Tall Grass, but she's also the author of a book, uh, Cindy, oh, it's called Chasing Dragonflies. I have my copy right beside me. It's a fantastic book. I think it came out last year, Cindy, I hope. 
but look that up. It's a little sort of stories about her, her monitoring dragonflies in the Chicago area. So I just want to put a plug in for her. You're in the book. Oh yes, I am in the book, yes. That's how I met Cindy actually. She asked some people, she was asking for people to contribute stories to her book and several of us in Ohio sent her stories. And so I was surprised, I met somebody, I was out doing a dragonfly survey one day and somebody came up to me and said, hey, I got the book, you're in the book. And I'm like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? <laughs> but now I have a copy with the pages marked where my name is mentioned. So that was a big thrill for me. Okay, it looks like we're done with questions. I'm not seeing any more. And if anyone comes up with a question later, you can always go to my website and send me an email there and I'll be glad to answer whatever you've got. 